Did you know that some of our favorite houseplants are actually toxic to pets? Yes, that is including the Monsteras that we are all obsessed with. At the recent Great Grow Along virtual plant festival that I was a part of, I interviewed Anastasia, my friend from Leaf and Paw, all about pets and plants and how you can be both a pet parent and a plant parent and how to have your plants and pets get along. Anastasia has a blog dedicated to her passion for collecting plants while caring for her two cats and a hedgehog. She's super knowledgeable on this topic and today she walks us through what we need to know about toxicity, how to style with pets in mind, and the top 10 best and worst plants for our pets. This has been a highly requested episode. I'm so excited to finally be giving it to you. So welcome Anastasia and welcome you to episode 122 of Blue Mangrove Radio. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Oh boy, oh boy, we are in the throes of spring. In my zone 5B up here, I'm still waiting for that last frost date to really get gardening, but I'm so excited. I feel spring, the joy of spring. I mean, I, it's just resounding and man, it's nice. It's nice to be coming out of the year that we just had. So anyway, I hope you are enjoying spring in your bodies, in your souls, in your plant collections as well. I'm so excited for today's episode and I'm so excited about about our newest Patreon supporters. So thank you so much, Trisha, Phoebe, and Christina. Thank you, thank you, thank you for becoming part of the group of listeners who supports Bloom and Grow monetarily on a monthly basis. For more information about our amazing Patreon plant friends, visit the show notes. I think this episode on Pets and Plants is probably my most highly requested episode from you guys for a while, definitely in the 2020 listener survey. So I'm so excited Anastasia agreed to join me for that great Grow Along event. And without further ado, here's Anastasia. Welcome, plant friends, to the great Grow Along Pet Safe Houseplants Conversation. I am your host, Maria, from the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast, a podcast all about houseplant care. And I am beyond thrilled to welcome such a special guest a plant lady, a cat lady, a fish lady, a <laughs> guinea pig lady, the plant pet expert, Anastasia from Leaf and Paw. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anastasia. Thank you for having me, Maria. Thank you. You know, this is probably one of the highest requested topics of my listener community, Pets and Plants, because I think it makes a lot of sense. There's a nurturer inside every plant parent, and I think it makes sense that a lot of plant parents actually are pet parents as well, because we all want to be taking care of things. And my joke is start with a plant then get a pet, then have a baby, right? Like that's the perception. (laughs) So before we dive into me just interrogating you about this amazing, complicating, excited topic, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you became the plant and pet lady you are today. So it is a story that I am not particularly proud of, but I think is very universal. So back in 2013, when like Instagram wasn't a thing and I was just Mm -hmm. on my own, I decided to buy a Dracaena marginata, which is like kind of palm tree like Dracaena. And I had one cat, an all black cat. I brought it home. A couple hours went by and she had eaten like, you know, 
a good quarter of it. And I was like, oh, you know, that stinks. Like my plant looks like garbage. And so I looked it up online and I was like, oh my God, it's toxic. Oh my God, mm. house plants could be toxic. Mm. So it ultimately led to me throwing the plant in the snow, me, you know, squirting my cat with water and freaking out, calling the vet. <laughs> so that whole thing happened. And I started working at a plant center in 2000, like, 16 or 15. And I was like, oh, like houseplants are kind of cool. Now I know like don't buy poisonous ones. <laughs> so I started to kind of get into them and absorbed all of this knowledge about what's toxic, what's not toxic. And I really wanted to put that somewhere. So I was like, let me start a blog. And it's been great. It was just like a hobby thing and it's turned into my business. So it's very cool. But I launched my blog in 2017 and I've bought more plants, more cats and additional animals to my household. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And now Leaf and Paw is, you know, a go-to resource for yeah. how to figure out and navigate the worlds of having plants and pets together. Yeah. I like to think so. You know, I think that's a really interesting point because with plant parents and so many different facets of plant care, you just don't know what you don't know. Right. right. Yeah. And why as humans who don't eat Monstera and don't eat houseplants, <laughs> how the heck would we know that these things are toxic? And I, I think know. a lot of plant parents go through that shock when they bring maybe a new pet home or they bring their first plant home. And then they've got this whole like struggle of what do they choose mm -hmm. and how do they navigate this? So why is it so important to be concerned about having plants and pets together? Well, and I think just based on my, you know, horrific story I just described, I wasn't concerned. Like, I think like mm. nobody knows. And as someone who's always loved animals, like the last thing I want to do is poison my pet intentionally. You know, nobody does. But I think we need to be concerned because it's not really out there. So if you go to, you know, Lowe's or some like garden center, I think they have them on there now, but they never used to have like pet safe or non-toxic house plants, mm -hmm. a little thimble or anything. So you're pretty much have to fend for yourself. So I think definitely now with Instagram, with, you know, blogs popping up, I think the concern has definitely come to, is more important, but I think this, there's such a struggle and then there's just so much panic and there's so much misinformation and it's such a, a touchy subject that I'm like happy to be involved with to clear up. <laughs> and it's so confusing too, because from what I understand, there's also levels of toxicity within plants. And so how do you know how <laughs> toxic a plant needs to be before you, you know, donate it or give it to your friend so you yeah. don't kill your cat, you know? So right. let's break down toxicity because I get a little curious about this and I wonder like, what is toxicity in regards to our plants and what do we need to know about it? So I'm not a botanist. I'm not a vet. The whole toxicity thing is very complicated. And mm -hmm. I was like racking my brain to think of like, how do I explain it so that it's not like complicated and you know cerebral? So think about it like this, like everything can technically be toxic if consumed in excess. Like if we consume a lot of chocolate, we'll get sick. If a pet consumes a lot of a toxic plant or a lot of a pet safe plant, they can get sick. So I kind of think of it as less like, toxic, non-toxic, like it's very murky. I try to think of it like, let's address toxicity as a whole. Like your pet really shouldn't be eating your plant, but if it does, that's when toxicity kind of comes into play. You should be concerned either way, but if it's a technically non-toxic plant, you might not have to worry as much. So this is kind of what I was thinking like as, as a good way to illustrate it. So I'll use like the Monstera as an example. I get a lot of questions from people saying, I have a Monstera, I have a new kitten. What do I, like, do I need to get rid of my Monstera? I know it's toxic. So a Monstera is part of the Araceae family. And that family, that plant family makes up a lot of like other genus plant families. So mm -hmm. there's Philodendrons, there's Diffenbachia are all part of this Araceae family. And this particular family, all of these plants are considered toxic, but plants in this family have compounds called calcium oxalate crystals. So under a microscope, these crystals look like little needles and spoiler alert, if ingested, these can cause all sorts of, you know, health issues. So when you think of a toxic plant, you know, there could be gastrointestinal issues, trouble breathing, like seizures, those little crystals that are causing all of this discomfort. So if your pet eats this plant or consumes it or bites it, there's a risk that that can happen. So 
basically that's why monstera is considered toxic it has these little things that are bad for you so don't eat them <laughs> so <laughs> a toxic plant is something that does not contain any of those biochemicals or not any level that would cause any discomfort if consumed but the mistake and like the hesitancy i have is that that doesn't mean your pet should eat a non-toxic plant like mm-hmm. an all you can eat buffet it just means it wouldn't cause those same symptoms that a toxic plant would. Like, I hope that makes sense. It is very confusing. That's why I just think of like, don't let your pets eat your plants. That's the okay. easiest way to do it. <laughs> in general, don't let your pet, yeah, <laughs> unless you're growing eat, cat grass. They should be eating other things. <laughs> okay. So plants have compounds that pets can't ingest and yeah. they will cause all of those symptoms that we know of, you know, toxicity symptoms. Right. So the non-toxic plants don't have those compounds. So you're, mm-hmm. they're a safer bet, but in general, yes. you're saying no pet should really be like non on any of your plans. Yeah. Like that possible. shouldn't, <laughs> that shouldn't be a thing. Right. It's, and I feel like that's just a safer, like to me, that's just a safer way to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, totally. Yeah. Totally. So what about the levels of toxicity? Because if my cat takes a bite of my Monstera right here, is it mm-hmm. going to die? I think there's this notion that people think that if their cat has like one bite of a plant that they're going to be, you know, in really big trouble. So how does that work in terms of the amount of stuff a pet is consuming? So that kind of, and like, that was kind of something I was thinking of talking about later, because that's also kind of complex, but I'll break this down into two categories. So for cats, there's always like a discovery bite where they just like, like a tiny bite of a leaf and then are like, ew, or like, yum. So mm-hmm. it's usually either, either one of those and that shouldn't cause any harm. Again, I'm not a vet, but uh-huh. that, sh- that shouldn't technically cause any harm unless it's a very, like a very, very toxic plant to a cat, like a lily, but like a monstera, that's probably fine. What you don't want to happen is, is the cat to be accustomed, to get accustomed to biting all your plants. So cats typically will do a discovery bite, sometimes to monsteras, usually to more like frond palm type plants. Dogs typically like barky or like bulb type plants, like like Mm -hmm. amaryllis, and they'll like gnaw on the bark or dig up a root. You know, it's all behavioral, like it's intuitive for them to do this. So I guess when it comes down to like levels of toxicity, it kind of depends, you know, what, what they do to the plant. A curiosity bite should be fine. You just don't want them to get accustomed to biting and eating anything. On a routine basis. So you talk about behavioral patterns. So are there ways that we can train our pets? Are there hacks that we can do with our plants to ensure that our pets don't get up all in our plant collection? Yes. So I'm going to be really blunt though. I actually don't like the like crafty, like deterrents, like the put orange peel in your soil. Like I'm not really, and it really creates fruit flies. I'm just going to say, but I'm more like architectural. So I just brief, I, through my blog, people have naturally reached out to me and have asked to do like consulting. So one thing I do consulting on is houseplant arrangement for pets. So people ask, show me their rooms and say, where can I put my plants or what can I do to keep them out of them? And it's, it's less about, you know, putting rocks on the soil, putting orange peel in the soil and more about using pieces of furniture that will eliminate them even wanting to like making the plants part of your home, part of the furniture, part of the landscape. So it blends in. So for example, I talk a lot about carts, like utility carts, like from Ikea or Target are fantastic because cats won't leap onto, they move, so cats won't leap onto them. They're pretty shallow. They're usually safe for dogs. Shelving units like this one, like that's very full. (laughs) A cat will not wanna go up there. I tend to go more that route instead of like trying a bunch of hacks and seeing what works. So, and that works. Like I've, I haven't had one person say, you know, my cat has started to eat my plants again. So that's great. One thing I will say that is you really need to know your pet and be a helicopter parent. So you might not have to worry about your cat eating your plants if you've if you've monitored them in a room with plants. It's like, know your cat. Know if your cat is going to attack your plants. If they tend to do that, you need to reconfigure your space so that you're not constantly battling. I think a lot of people tend to, to battle with their pet 
or, you know, freak out and spray them. And I think you really just need to realize that they're curious and you need to work together as a team. So what about Monstera are a great example. They're a classic like big floor plant, or I believe our snake plants are slightly toxic as well, right? Yes. They're another like common floor plant. So I totally get and appreciate organizing and using shelves and things like that. What about those floor plants with designing? How do you navigate that? I used to use plant stands. So I have mostly large plants in my house and I had trouble with cats paw, not eating, but like pawing, tearing my poor monstera's leaves and, and mm-hmm. putting them through the worst. But I use just small, like, like the mid-century modern little plant stands that you see all over. And that keeps them just high enough off the floor that they can't get into any large pot and they can't necessarily reach any leaves. If there's mm-hmm. still like problems with the digging You could also use pedestals. Like I know it's kind of like a weird thing, but I actually have Mm -hmm. a lot of like, like marble pedestals in my house. And those are amazing. They're just a little weird, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. like those work great for plants. It keeps them up off the ground. If you have a really big floor plant that a plant stand can't accommodate, you could try like a chicken wire around the plant. But I mean, if you're going to be doing that, you might want to just relocate the plant. That's not going to look pretty. (laughs) <laughs> so if you want chicken wire in their house. Yeah. Out, maybe for outdoor plants, but not, yeah, for indoor. not for indoor. Now I have heard episode eight way back when, four years ago on, on Bloom and Grow Radio, I had a, a cat lady come on and she talked about having a lot of success with putting large river stones mm-hmm. in her big pots, like for digging. Have you ever heard of that? I have heard of that. I don't have a dog and I know dogs are like tend to dig more than cat. Well, Mm -hmm. cats can also do that too. But yeah, that's a more aesthetically pleasing way to kind of fill the top of the planter. And that's like less of a hack. That's actually like a pretty common interior design, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I I would say that's that's definitely something that could work if if you have like a nesting problem. <laughs> a little digger. Yeah. And then also what about, have you heard, I mean, do you, have you ever tried any of those sprays like an apple cider vinegar spray or, and yeah. I've seen those before. Like, do you encourage those for those cats or dogs who are a little bit more aggressive? Like the ones you were talking about that might be all up in your plants. All up in it. Yeah. I, I have, to, so I've just tried everything for like just for funsies to see what worked. Like, like my poor cats are like, I hate the smell of vinegar, but I did try all of those and they just like, they smell like vinegar. And I rather, mm-hmm. again, I'd rather incorporate my plants, make it work and not have to like worry about spraying or digging up stuff in my pot and just relocate a plant. Like if you're in a small apartment and you can't do that, that might be your only alternative, in which case you could try it. But I have consulted a lot of people and I've never had them say, I went back to a spray or I went back to putting something in my soil. So it, I guess it works. It sounds it like is. that's a much more sustainable way of just curating your plants in a way so that you don't have to think about it as much. Thank you, Allagash Brewing Company, for sponsoring today's episode. Allagash Brewing Company is an amazing brewery out of Portland, Maine, that has just come out with Fine Acre, my new favorite beer. It's so good. It's a golden ale that is not only crisp and delicious and refreshing as the spring warmth is joining us, but it's also certified organic by the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. The gardeners approve. (laughs) Okay, so what even makes a beer organic, you might ask? Well, let me tell you. The beer has to be brewed with intense entirely organic ingredients. The land used to cultivate those organic ingredients can have no synthetic chemical fertilizers or pesticides used for a period of three years and is annually inspected. Plus, the brewery has to clean out the brewing system to ensure that there's no mixing of other non-organic stuff. So it takes serious dedication to brew an organic beer and Allagash, man, they're just good people brewing good beer, I gotta say. But regardless of the fact that it's organic, I really do have to say, even though I'm not like an insane, intense beer aficionado or beer drinker, it's really just so tasty. It's beautifully balanced, which is a big thing for me when it comes to craft beer. And it's just so crisp and delicious. So whether you're a beer nerd or a beer novice, it's tasty. That's all I'm going to say about it. Okay, so here's where the plantiness really gets exciting. With Allagash, they are running the Beer Gardening with Allagash sweepstakes, and I'm partnering with them for it. The prize is amazing. It's an hour-long plant consultation with me over Zoom. 
$300 to Bloomscape, which is houseplants delivered to your door, potted houseplants, they're amazing, a $100 Allagash merch gift card, and the chance to direct $2,500 to a community garden nonprofit of your choice. Seriously, over $3,000 of goodies. Check the show notes for details on how to enter the sweepstakes and find Fine Acre near you. Fine Acre and other Allagash beers are for drinkers 21 and older. Please drink responsibly, plant friends. Thank you, Espoma Organic, for sponsoring today's episode. Plant friends, we all know I love Espoma. They're a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Like I said earlier, their literal motto is people, pets, and the planet. So if you have pets, Espoma is a great choice because their products are organic and pet safe. They have potting mixes. Literally, they have a potting mix for any type of gardening you're doing. They have fertilizers, pest control options. Whatever you need, they got. And it's gardening season and it's repotting season, plant friends. So if you have pot-bound plants, if you're getting out in your garden, they definitely have an option for you. Their all-purpose potting mix and their cactus mix are my go-to potting options for my house plants. Lately, too, I've gotten into their orchid mix and I mix their orchid mix into the potting mix. And also, I'll be using their raised bed mix and their biotone starter for my outdoor garden in my raised beds this year. I'm so excited. You know, being the city girl that I am, I didn't realize that most lawns are actually fertilized with pesticides that can potentially be harmful to children, pets, and the environment. So Espoma is acknowledging that problem by developing pet and child-friendly organic lawn food, which is a great option for people looking to safely feed their lawns while rearing their children and their plants and their pets. So if you're interested to have a free Safe Paws campaign download with a seven-tip checklist to keep pets happy and healthy, it's linked in the show notes. To learn more about their amazing pet-safe indoor and outdoor gardening products, check the show notes or visit Espoma.com to find your local Espoma dealer near you. Talk to me about symptoms. What symptoms should we be looking for in case we, you know, don't necessarily know if our cat or dog ate one, ate a plant, and we're kind of wanting to be on the lookout? What should we be looking Mm -hmm. for? So I'm going to share a little story because I think it kind of sums up a type of person that may look at this, may look at their pet eating a plant in a certain way. So I did consulting a consulting session with a woman. And when I got on the video call, the first thing she showed me was like a half eaten Monstera. And she was just like laughing and saying, you know, oh, look what my dog did or, you know, a cat, I don't remember. Look what my dog or cat did, you know? And I was like, calmly, I'm like, is your pet okay? And she's like, oh yeah, he's fine. I'm, I'm looking out for him. And then I said, did you, you know, take him to the vet or anything? She said, no, I'm just watching. He'll probably be fine. No. (laughs) Okay. I'm not a vet, but the worst thing you can do if you know that your pet has eaten a plant is like let time pass. So that's like a worst case scenario. Like I'm assuming most pet parents freak out like I did when I first realized my pet ate a plant, but typical symptoms that you may find are like drooling, vomiting, like weird nervous system things like dizziness or shaking or there could be no symptoms at all. And there could be some gastrointestinal stuff going on that you may not find out until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So the worst thing you can do if you find a half eaten plant, even if it's like a week ago is wait. So I think the number one thing takeaway that I always tell people is that you contact your vet. Number one, if you see a half eaten plant and you know which animal did it, if you don't call your vet about both, you know, identify the plant, see if you can kind of gross, but like, see if you see any like cat vomit or something around to tell you that it was indeed Mm -hmm. consumed, call your vet or call the pet poison hotline. They're great. I push them a lot on my site. They offer help if your vet's closed or something. They're a fantastic resource. And obviously once you get a hold of your vet, you want to make sure you tell them which plant it was, the name of the plant. If you know it, You shouldn't really have plants you don't know the name of in your home anyway, and then follow your vet's instructions. Again, the worst thing you could do is wait. You really want to, if you see a half-eaten plant, no matter if it was last week, you want to call your vet and make sure that your pet is safe. I love it. Yeah. Better to be safe than sorry, right? Exactly. Especially with your pet. Especially with your pet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So what about other potentially toxic plant-related things that aren't necessarily plants? Mm -hmm. Like fertilizers and things? Yeah. What else do we have to look out for? So a question I get a lot is insecticides. Mm -hmm. So if you have spider mites, which are, you know, the devil's spawn, if you Mm -hmm. have spider mites or thrips, 
you're naturally going to use something powerful to make them be gone, eradicate them. Yes. yes. From, from your home forever and always. But those, are, those can be toxic to, to pets and they smell terrible. It's usually neem oil, which smells mm-hmm. to high heaven. So you should be doing that outside anyway. You should be spraying your plant outdoors and then keeping it quarantined while all that you know goes mm-hmm. down. So I, I wouldn't recommend spraying neem oil in your home anyway. Um, those could be toxic in smell. If a cat licks neem oil, like it's just bad. Like, no. Okay. <laughs> That's, I wouldn't recommend doing that in your home at all. So fertilizers I use, I won't name any brands. I don't know if we could do that, but I use a couple fertilizers exclusively that are organic. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people think that organic means safe for pets. And that's not always true. So okay. sometimes fertilizers have a little like safe to use outdoors, you know, like if a cat wanders into your yard, they're not going to get sick. If it doesn't say that I would, you can call the company and you can ask or find a different one that has that little label on it. Again, better to be safe than sorry. There isn't necessarily a worry about a cat eating fertilizer. It's more like if you have a plant like this and then like a little drain tray and they lick that water that has fertilizer in it, that can be toxic. So, okay. Cause a, yeah. a cat might look at it like their water bowl and mm-hmm. start or a dog. it yes. and ingest the fertilizer. Okay. Right. So with fertilizers, first be wary of insecticide, fungicide, basically anything chemical, try and go yes. organic, but then more importantly of the organic, you said the, the key to knowing that it's safe for pets is to actually look for the safe for outdoors label. Right. It, it's usually like a safe, it's kind of like what they put on salt you know, like to salt okay. your driveway, mm-hmm. like there's like a dog safe version at war because your dog's okay. in and out or a not like a chemically one. So I have seen fertilizers that have that little label on them. Mm-hmm. The one I use does. So mm-hmm. they're out there. If you're just unsure, it doesn't hurt to contact them. They might have it on their website. I just always check. I'd rather not use something that would be toxic if they ingest some water. So totally. Yeah. I think the one good thing about plant parents and pet parents is that we like to do our research. We like to make sure we're doing good by our babies, whether they're plant babies or fur babies. (laughs) So along those lines, what resources do you recommend if we want to, if our pet has eaten something, or if we just want to, you know, broaden our knowledge on this topic, like where do you go to learn more? So I, I mentioned before that back in 2013, resources were kind of slim. Mm -hmm. they're a lot better now but Mm -hmm. with more information comes a lot of wrong information Mm -hmm. and it does get frustrating as somebody who does this and does consulting that sees a lot of misinformation on Instagram and whatever but it is what it is the best site like you could ignore all that stuff the best site Mm -hmm. is the ASPCA website I worked with the ASPCA you know, I volunteer with SPCA, so I'm, I'm close to the organization to begin with, but mm-hmm. their resource is the most comprehensive. They have Latin names of plants. They have common random names of plants that you may know more. Mm. Just make that your resource. My blog is not meant to replace that at all. It's more to work in tandem. So mm-hmm. whereas the ASPCA website is like a list, like a bullet mm-hmm. list, like it doesn't say levels of toxicity or anything. I chose to go a more why the monstera is toxic, what parts of the monstera are toxic. So I kind of Mm -hmm. provide, you know, if you want to learn more and be really geeky, you can look at my website, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but if you want a list, you could go to the ASPCA. What was the hotline you mentioned again? The pet poison hotline. They also have information about plants and also about other things in your home that could be toxic. Those are great to check out. If you have pets, you should definitely check those out. That's amazing. So you can just call them up and ask them your specific question and they'll get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. They're fantastic. They're great. That's amazing. Okay. So we've had this kind of larger conversation about toxicity and what to look for and where to go and who to consult. Now let's talk about plants. Yeah. So (laughs) what we understand that there's different levels of toxicity. What are the plants, the top 10 plants that you really have to be careful bringing indoors if you have pets? So the top 10 most toxic plants to be most fearful of. Yes. So there's, there's a, I kind of narrowed it down by various plant, uh, like a genus of. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention is you can also hang your plants. I realized Mm -hmm. hanging plants is a great way to get them away from everybody. And the reason I thought of that is because my first 
toxic houseplant is pothos. So I have mm. pothos. I have like many of them in my home climbing my walls, but they're up, like they're up away from cat paws and mm -hmm. mouths. <laughs> so I don't need to worry about that. But pothos are a very common house plant. They have those little calcium oxalate crystals that are little dives. So you don't want your cat reaching those. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's my number one. That's my, my first one, because it's the most common would be the pothos in all varieties. The second, I'm going to say monstera. So there's obviously okay. more than one monstera aside from the deliciosa, but all monstera types are the same. They're all considered toxic and mm -hmm. be wary if you have one. I guess I'll kind of go in like a popularity order. So okay. monstera, ficus, like ficus and rubber trees. I also have both, but they're huge. Like fiddle leaf figs, rubber trees actually have like a sap, like a milky sap. Like if you yes. bite the leaf, that is gross mm -hmm. and unpleasant and for humans and cats. So they're toxic if you eat them, but also like be careful for humans because it mm -hmm. literally excretes rubber and is super annoying to get off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I consider those, those toxic for all pets and humans. Dracaena. So I mentioned that I, that was the first house plant that made me panic as a pet parent, but all Dracaena varieties are considered toxic. And one thing I want to mention is that it's important to like, this is like a, a dorky thing, but it's very helpful. And no one told me this in the beginning is that you should really learn the Latin names of plants. So like, oh yeah, but like, it's, the, it's like not an obvious thing, but it's so important because Dracaenas look like palm trees. And sometimes mm -hmm. like people are like, oh, you know, that's a, and palm trees are mostly safe for pets. So it's, it's a bit of a, like, if, if you see on the tag that something is a Dracaena, but it looks like a palm tree, you know, you know, you're covered, you know, that you shouldn't mm -hmm. purchase this plant. But I just wanted to bring that up because Dracaenas kind of look like a lot of, they're like everywhere. I'm not a huge mm -hmm. fan, but they're everywhere. And they're considered, a all varieties are considered toxic. So let's see, Diffenbachia is another one. Those are usually larger mm -hmm. plants, floor plants, but they are actually very considered a little more toxic on if you're if we're going to talk about that spectrum again and i want to talk about palm trees again because a lot of palms are considered safe like the majesty palm which you see everywhere mm -hmm. but the sago palm is very 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 toxic and for some reason dogs really like it because it has that like bulbous mm, that root. nice juicy yeah, kind like, of bulb at yeah. the bottom it's so biteable apparently yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i'm not interested but apparently dogs are so that's, that's something, and those grow outside in California. So indoor or outdoor, sago palm is definitely something you want to think about if you have a dog or a cat, they shouldn't be in your home or near your home because they're toxic indoors and out. Mm -hmm. Azizi plant, also very popular, very hardy. Those are also considered toxic and a little bit toxic to people as well. They also have like that sap, like a milky okay. sap. I, do you want to touch on string of pearls? Sure. Are like, they toxic too? They are, but I, I want to bring them up because a lot of succulents are safe. So I think it's okay. interesting that string of pearls is not. I know most people. And those are like fun little juicy strands that you can they play are. with like really, and want like, to eat. Edible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's an important one to know for sure. Yeah. Because you think but succulents. But also string of pearls are something that you would hang. True. A lot of times. So you could hang True. them up high and hopefully have them out of, out of reach. Out of reach. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I have one and it hates me like so much. So I'm mm -hmm. just like, mm. but they are considered <laughs> toxic. <laughs> okay. um, and while we're getting into like St. Patrick's day, oxalis, the little like mm -hmm. clover plants that you see everywhere, yeah. those, those are considered toxic and they're kind of like fluttery. And I actually bought one home and my cat was kind of interested and I was like, nope. So interesting. Yeah. So I would definitely keep those like, you know, hang them or something if you need to have one for St. Patrick's day. Um, that's funny. Cause some of those are edible to humans. So it's funny that they're non-toxic to humans, but toxic to pets. Very interesting. It is weird. Science is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I, that was about 10. I have one more, which is the like alocasia. Okay. Plants. So those are like typically like they're kind of bulby as well, but people mm -hmm. grow those indoors and out. And that's just another one like the sago palm, just to look out for it's toxic. Don't let your dog eat it. That's wild. That's a lot of really common house plants. It unfortunately so, is. I think a lot of people watching this right now probably are going to be like, 
holy moly, I have all these plants in my house. Yeah, so probably. <laughs> what would your advice be to someone who's like having a panic attack right now? <laughs> so let me just tell you, I've been there. <laughs> and don't panic, but you probably will. So that's that's where my like tech, like architectural technique comes in is like, let's reconfigure so that, you know, maybe things aren't as accessible. Another thing that I, I like to, to think about, like, again, my pets are like 10 times more important than my plants. And I know that this is like a plant conference, but I'm going to say that. Um, oh yeah. I don't think anybody's going to argue. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I just, but I, that's the game changer. Like if it's something that I could easily maneuver or hang or arrange in a way that's not, again, like going to make myself and my pet fight or have some kind of anxiety, like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of it. So yeah. If you have like all of these plants and you have a new kitten, I'm really sorry, but you should either like throw them all in a room for now or, or see what your kitten does, but I wouldn't recommend it because kittens are ridiculous. Think about it logically. Like you want to make sure that all of these are out of reach. If you need to have all of these toxic house plants, you know, maybe don't have a cat. <laughs> no. Hey, and maybe it's an opportunity to gift some of your toxic house right. plants to Which make is what I did. for some non-toxic house plants. Exactly. So let's flip exactly. it, get a little positive <laughs> now that we've all freaked out. What are your favorite <laughs> non-toxic plants for people to have with their pets? Well, I have really good news. So okay. I was very disheartened in the beginning as well. I was like, so I can only have a spider plant. Like, is that the right. only thing I can have? And everyone thinks that like stupid spider plants. I love them, mm-hmm. but like- I'm over it, but there's so many, there's so many plants. And on my blog, I specifically make blog posts about like pet safe plants that are maybe you wouldn't know about. So mm-hmm. here's like a top 10 is uh, Peperomia is a great. Such uh, a huge genus. So many different types yeah. of species that you could just fill your house with Peperomia and yeah. have it look amazing. Yeah. They're, they're, well, they're adorable and they're like little like chubby plants. Here's like a, I have a string of turtles that Mm -hmm. I just got that I'm very proud of, but they're, they're very cute and they're a little smaller, but there's some that hang. There's some that drape. There's some that are just small and petite, huge, huge amount of options there. Options for sure. Yes. Kind of related, but usually in the same section as Peperomia are uh, Calathea. Mm -hmm. Many people dislike, but I think they should give them a chance. (laughs) Higher maintenance plant. (laughs) Kind of. But just put them in your bathroom and they'll be happy. Right. That seems to mm-hmm. be the trick. They're mm-hmm. fantastic. I have, I don't know if you probably can't see it, but I have a, a gorgeous one behind me and they're a little finicky, but they're beautiful. They fold mm-hmm. up at night. Maranta is a, it's a very similar plant called a prayer plant and they're pet friendly, very pretty, like mm-hmm. really nice variegation for a pet safe plant. So I, I always tell people, you know, just try it. Just, you know. It's five bucks. Try it. You might like it. They're really pretty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Another, Mike, another one of my favorites is Hoya. Yeah. Like people forget. So I mean, people forget. These are great options. Okay. You get those beautiful fragrant blooms with Hoyas. Yeah. Like I'm like obsessed with Hoya right Mm now. And, and there's, again, there's like, every time I think I have all the varieties, someone's like, look what I have. And I'm like, I have to have this. Yeah. So Hoya is a fantastic, there's uh, the Carnosa, there's the Hindu rope, which is that like tightly wound. I have one. My favorite one. Somewhere. I have it too. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and they're so pretty. They bloom, which is super rare for a house plant. Mm-hmm. They're, I, th- I think they're just, they're great. And and they're like Pokemon. You like got to catch them all. You know, you yeah, got to get all that's of exactly. them. It, Peperomia <laughs> and Hoya are very similar where like yeah. you find a lot of collectors like getting yeah. the whole the whole span. Okay. That's that's exactly it. Yes. So I I love Hoya. I highly recommend people get into that. On the same note, succulents. So I mentioned mm-hmm. before that like string of pearls is considered toxic, but Echeveria and like lithops, the little like living rocks. Yeah. Those are, living stones. Yeah. Yes. Those are considered mm-hmm. non-toxic. Most, like most of the Echeveria that you see is, well, Echeveria as, as a genus is pet safe, but mm-hmm. most succulents and cacti are considered pet safe. I just always am a little weary because of like thorns and stuff on cacti. So I, I try and cats like rub their faces on everything. Mm-hmm. So I'm always like, maybe just stick with the succulents and don't get cactuses. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, the only one that I wouldn't recommend is aloe. Aloe are considered toxic. Okay. Which is kind of weird, but they are. And 
I, I will mention the spider plant that spider plants are considered non-toxic. Wouldn't recommend getting one if you have a cat because they are cat magnets. Cats will like see because they're like little pom pom. Their their babies yeah. are like little pom poms just taunting them hanging from the sky. It's awful. Like every yeah, time mine looks beautiful, like I get sh- shredded and I just cry and I can't do anything about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but spider it's plants so are a great option. Just hang them up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, ferns also a good hanging plant like a Boston fern is a really nice statement plant that you can, you can put kind of can also be a cat magnet also does well in bathrooms, <laughs> but okay. any, like any type of fern, I love staghorn ferns, which you can actually mm-hmm. mount to the wall. So that keeps them up off nice and high up too. I love yeah. this list because you really have something for every type of plant parent. You've got the hardy succulents for mm-hmm. someone who can't water frequently. You've got the high moisture <laughs> loving ferns. You've got yes. the Hoyas for the collectors. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Yeah. African violets are kind of a no brainer. They're not for everybody, but they're, they're cute and they're pretty. And again, mm-hmm. like a collectory type of thing. Phalaenopsis orchids are one of my favorite pet safe plants. They're the orchids you see in like dentist's office and spas. Yeah but they're, they're very common. They're pretty and they're very low maintenance. Mm -hmm. And I'll do one more. I'll do pilea, pilea peperomioides was our favorite plant. Instagram (laughs) famous plant. Yeah. It plant what like two, three years ago, two two years ago. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And now everyone has one in it and they're all over it, but Uh but pilea are fantastic, especially the peperomioides variety, uh, you know, really adorable, kind of similar to the, to Hoya. There's a lot of different varieties. They look very different. Um, mm-hmm. there's some, some draping plants. They're very, they're fun. <laughs> they're very fun. I love that. Yeah. Well, this is a really nice list of plants that people could yes. fill their homes with. I mean, come <laughs> on now. Are there any large, like a big, if I wanted a statement plant, what would be a non-toxic statement plant? So this is really like a weird, so I get this question all the time mm-hmm. and, and people are like, really banana tree. So, okay. so actually a friend of mine on Instagram, has a, a variegated banana tree mm-hmm. that is gorgeous, which are, they're very hard to find, but they're, they're kind of like, like bird of paradise with the really mm-hmm. big leaves. Yeah. Uh, but gorgeous they're considered leaves. non-toxic. They just need a lot of light. They might not give you bananas, but you're not buying them for the bananas. You're buying them for no. them. They're, yes. uh, they're, they're really pretty and they're way more like accessible than I thought they would be. I thought they'd be really hard to find, but I am looking forward to getting one myself. Also like a, a majesty palm. Like a, a large palm tree would, is a really nice plant. Palm trees are a little finicky. They just have to be watered a lot and need a lot of sun. I love it. Well, we have the tiniest succulent to the biggest banana. We do. Plant. <laughs> so watchers of great grow along, go forth and collect the right plants that are going to suit your pets. Anastasia, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. I love that we have this community of plant parents that are, you know, nurturing pets, nurturing plants. It's all a beautiful thing. So mm-hmm. thank you so much. Make sure to go check out Anastasia's blog at Leaf and Paw. You can come over to Bloom and Grow Radio and learn more about plants with us. And thank you so much. Until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. Thank you so much, Anastasia. I don't have pets yet, but Billy and I have pretty intense puppy fever, just like everyone else in 2020. We did restrain ourselves. We did not adopt in 2020 when we really wanted to, but I can definitely see a puppy in our future. So it's really good to know all of these things, know all of these tips. Make sure you go visit Leaf and Paw if you want to follow Anastasia on all of those accounts. Check out her blog if you do have a pet and you want to learn more. Thank you again to our amazing Patreon Plant Friend supporters. Thank you so much to our sponsors. And Plant Friends, I hope you're enjoying spring. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant Friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content 
or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Planned Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality, and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at bloomandgrowradio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month, and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. 
After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 